That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Brooks. Good morning. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Miss Layla McCain, and it's my first year at Brooks. I teach history, I also work in admissions, and I live in the lovely Merriman dorm with my 20 favorite roommates. <laughs> I am here to talk to you today about my quarter life crisis. But in order to do so, I'm going to provide you with some really important background information that led to said crisis. Uh, so I was born and raised in Boston to my two parents, Rory and Jeff, if we could get slide number one. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I grew up an extremely hopeful young girl. I was really lucky to have parents that sheltered me from any possible worries in the world. They instilled in me that if I dreamt it, I could do it. My opportunities were endless and I was unstoppable. Of course I believed my parents, especially since every night after dinner when we watched the news, I was looking at the first black president in America on TV. My parents were the American dream, a mixed race couple with just one beautiful daughter that they spoiled. Neither holding college degrees, but still able to have good paying blue and white collar jobs, able to live in nice apartments and houses with good school districts. We even had a really adorable lap dog, which is obviously the quintessential part of the American dream. Uh, I had every reason to believe that if I worked hard, I, this was possible for me and more. I was privileged to have such a happy childhood and parents who loved and supported me. Growing up, I knew that my family looked different from most of my friends, but I didn't really care. As mentioned, my parents did everything in the world to isolate me from the horrors of the world. Up until middle school, they referred to people in shades and didn't acknowledge any real differences between ethnic and racial groups. I understood some of the unique parts of my culture and the cultures I grew up in, but beyond that, I was just taught to see everyone as equal. Today, we might refer to this as a color blindness, but back then, it was an active choice that my parents made to protect me from the possibility of ever having to feel different. I had no reason to question my utopia until it became time for me to apply to secondary schools. You all have been there before. That's when I was faced with the first difficult decision of my short 12 year life. When filling out forms to take the independent school entrance exam, I had to decide whether to check the box for white or check the box for black. In 2011, there was no other box and no mixed option either. My family agonized over this choice for weeks. This was the first time I truly began to question the systems around me. Would marking white privilege mom's world and make dad's world feel invisible? Could we mark one and not feel terrible about our complicity in the world's simplifications? Had my parents done me a disservice by pretending that the world saw shades? And finally, would marking black increase my chances of getting into Boston Latin School, but also somehow leave me feeling guilty or undeserving? This feeling of not belonging to either racial group is hard to understand for the majority of people. And having to do that amount of deep soul searching at the age of 12 is equally upsetting. I had finally begun to understand some of the comments that had been made to me on the playground. You don't look black. You don't talk black. Why does your hair look like that? Oh my God, is your dad in the NFL? Truly, happened multiple times. <laughs> I ended up going to Boston Latin. I can look back on my schooling experience now and tell you that it did make me stronger. So don't worry, this is all worth it in the end. <laughs> of course, I continued to hear the microaggressions and they even got worse for a bit when it was college decision time. I was told several times that I only got into Bowdoin because they needed to meet diversity quotas. But as I learned more history, yeah, history, and read more books, I actually began to feel much more comfortable with myself and my identities despite what anybody said. This comfortability and confidence was also absolutely a privilege. In fact, reading and learning so much in high school motivated me into a path of activism, and I became really interested in local government and policy. Can we get the next slide? Beautiful. So these are some of my experiences in high school um, working for various city governments. I also was on an ad that was on the orange line for a while, which was kind of cool. Um, yeah, no, no big deal. <laughs> Boston has a lot of great systems in place to give youth a real voice in making change throughout the city. I was on the Mayor's Youth Council, I interned at Suffolk Superior Court for a while, and then I was interning with City Council President Michelle Wu, who is now the Boston Mayor. I saw firsthand some of the examples of really effective government structures. 
I also became quickly aware of a lot of city and countrywide issues, especially pertaining to racial equity and economic inequality, as I spoke to different constituents throughout the city and dipped into meetings around City Hall. But through initiatives that I was a part of and seeing a lot of people of color in powerful positions in Boston, I was incredibly hopeful that we were moving in an equitable and progressive direction. Since I was so lucky to be a part of so much local change, I was confident that my calling was to do this on a bigger scale. I believed that law and policy were the main reasons for all the changes I got to witness. And it made me hopeful about potentially pursuing that as a long-term career. My junior year of high school, bigotry was widespread in America at the federal level. I remember that being the first real blow to my hopefulness for America's future. I was worried we would be set back to some of America's old and ugly ways. But I was still surrounded by so many young change agents that I was hopeful we could undo or protest any real threat to pro progress and equity. Going off to college, I found it to be true that these were certainly the best four years of my life. Academic and social exploration, meeting a talented and special community from all over the world, and basking in the beautiful nature that surrounded me in Maine. I was really fond of the liberal arts experience because of because of all the types of classes and styles of learning that I got to be a part of. I still believed that my calling was to create big societal change and that my college experience would give me the skills to help make this dream a reality. At this point, I had also discovered a passion for teaching and working with young people, especially those who are in disadvantaged communities. I was hoping to instill the same hope in them that the par my parents instilled in me. I was a first generation woman of color who had made it and was excited about what the future would hold. That was until my quarter life crisis began in the spring of 2020. That was certainly a lot of background information, but I think most of it will be relevant. I like to call my junior year of college the perfect storm. I was deep into my major at this point and was continuing to learn about the systemic inequities that existed for low income and BIPOC communities, especially in terms of food access, healthcare, and job opportunities. Unfortunately, my class was often, often interrupted with impromptu headlines of the latest atrocities, killings, or injustices that were taking place. I felt aware, and I felt fired up, but at the same time, demoralized because of how many horrible things I was learning about. But I was continuously reminded of the passions I had, providing everybody with a quality education, mentoring, and advocating for change. I thought perhaps this was a career path I could give my strengths to long term. But at this point, part of me felt guilty. It's a sad reality that teachers are underpaid in America, and especially those who work in impoverished districts. My parents had invested so much in me throughout the years, and I was scared to tell them I no longer wanted to be this big shot lawyer. This feeling tends to happen, especially in homes that have experienced a generational wealth gap. This feeling that your career is not a personal choice, rather something you have to choose to make money to give back to those who helped you get there. I continued learning and working towards my degree. I read Aristotle's Politics, in which he lays out his ideal form of government, somewhere between an oligarchy and a democracy. I view what he argues is ideal as a rigid caste system that upholds economic inequality. It was quite striking to see how precise Aristotle was and how those who control almost all of America's wealth make up that oligarchy he talks about, while just average citizens are under the assumption we live in a democracy where their voices matter. As I continued to realize the connections between all that I was learning, I was absolutely heartbroken. Everything that I had seen and experienced in my years of working in government and law, was it a lie? Could I ever make the level of change and difference that I wanted to? I began to believe that no matter how hard I worked and tried, I was never going to make a change. Now this sounds awfully dramatic, <laughs> but to have everything I believed in be disproved after just three years of classes was absolutely gut-wrenching. If these classes were not enough to wreak havoc about my future, in March 2020, as many of you remember, the world shut down for COVID and the rest of my semester went remote. I had so much unexpected but gifted time to be with my family again. But this time, our after dinner routines looked much different than when I was a kid. Every night after dinner when we watched the news, I was just continuing to see the divisions grow in this country. The pandemic revealed the ugliness and deep-rooted disparities in America. Low-income and BIPOC communities tended to be those essential workers on the front lines every day, risking their lives to go to work and provide for their families, while those who had the privilege to ignore the pandemic, including a lot of my college classmates, were continuing to party and travel during the early stages. 
On top of that, we were just continuing to see disturbing videos of black men and women being murdered by police, and in some case, just by white civilians with little to no legal consequences. I continued to wonder how this could be possible when I had seen the law work in the favor of progress before. I knew law and policy worked to implement change, so why could it not persist in these high-level cases? It continued to be the case that the majority of, ex of exposure we got of black, and brown people of black and brown communities was through trauma. No matter how much we protested, fought, donated, signed petitions, phone banked, there was no justice. At this point, it was one thing after another. I was questioning absolutely everything as I started to think more about my future. How was I going to join an economic system that I vehemently disagree with? At the same time, how can I disagree with this system when I've been so lucky to benefit from it from my parents' hard work? But continuing to operate in this system is actively working against poor and BIPOC communities. And even if I could spend every single day of my life working to fight the system, my biggest obstacle is going to be that the system is working exactly how it was intended to. It was benefiting exactly who the founders hoped it would. I began to realize that the reason I had such hope is because my family was the exception, not the norm. My hope was gone. I grew up thinking so highly of opportunity in America for it all to come crashing down at the young age of 20. I let myself stay in this dark place until the end of my senior spring. As my classmates began taking jobs all over the world, I was excited to see that such good-hearted people were entering fields that could use a new perspective. One of the best things that college taught us was how to be a good person in all aspects of life. But at the same time, I worried my classmates would become complacent once joining the system. So where did this leave me, you might ask? Next slide, please. <laughs> so that's a photo of my graduation. Um, but three weeks after graduating, I picked up and moved my life to Stuttgart, Germany. And I worked at their international school for a year. Having space from living in America was incredible for me. My year in Germany had its ups and downs. You can see the photo on the right is after I cried for about two hours when I first got there. Um, <laughs> um, but I could do a whole other speech kind of on my year in Germany. Maybe one day I will. Um, but overall, it was amazing. I was able to travel around Europe, continue to build my cultural competency, and become a better educator. However, there were a lot of tears and moments of feeling incredibly alone. Of course, I know how privileged in ways we are to live here, but by taking space from my home and having a fresh start after the really difficult year I would refer to as my quarter-life crisis, I was really able to reevaluate my values and focus on my personal happiness and mental health. I finally felt fulfilled. As my year was coming to a close there, I had to start thinking about my next step. For my family, it was law school. But for me, it was continuing to teach. As my 10th grade modern world class could tell you, the end of crisis presents an opportunity for rebirth. For me, rebirth was finding my happiness and joy. It was knowing I needed space and a fresh start. It was coming to realize that my calling is to use my voice and my education to educate the next class of leaders, to go fight the fight that I am for my own mental health not equipped to fight. I feel so lucky to have landed at Brooks to do just that. I can genuinely say to each and every one of you that I wake up every day motivated, excited, and happy about my job. And that, too, is absolutely a privilege. As Mr. Chapman mentioned in his speech on Monday, some of us are going to aspire to be the ocean, while some of us may just be a small drop. While initially I always thought I was going to be a leader like the ocean, I had to put myself first. I had to tackle some very difficult internal questions. I had to learn it's okay to change my life path, and in choosing happiness, sometimes it's okay to be a little bit selfish. I challenge all of you to grapple with the difficult questions. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Take space. Push yourself out of your comfort zone and find your happiness. So while I may not be the ocean, I feel confident today in saying that I'm definitely contributing a few small drops. Thank you.